Uh, we'll, we'll do a, the Q&A session at the end, but let me turn the floor over to Kabir Kasargur. I hope I'm saying your name correctly. He's part of the TuneNet business development team at Qualcomm Life, uh, leads software partnership initiatives and strategy related to mobile apps and services. Prior to that, he was part of the VVS solution within Qualcomm Labs and has also worked at Verizon and Ericsson. Thank you so much for joining us, Kabir. So when uh, I was asked to present this, I was trying to think about what would make the most sense for this audience, given that you're looking at the landscape across the board. So the start of the slides really focus on mobile, but then we go really deep into the wireless health side as well, and all in 20 minutes. So we'll do this quickly. So let's really look at what mobile is. So when you look at mobile as the most dominant platform, and I doubt it if anyone here doesn't have a mobile phone in their pocket or nearby right now, uh, there's about 7 billion phones out there. And these phones include tablets, uh, smartphones, uh, feature phones. And there's only about 3 billion of us uniquely carrying them. So there's many of us carrying more than one phone. And uh, as both Michelle and Vijay mentioned, uh, the proliferation is just tremendous. So there's, in some places, there's more people uh, with access to drinking water, uh, uh, to mobile phones than to drinking water or electricity. So that's a testament of how this has become the dominant platform. And if this is the dominant platform, then why not use that for healthcare? That's really the fundamental question that we want to answer today. So this is a very poignant picture that I like to present whenever I get an opportunity. This was the scene when uh, people came to visit uh, Pope Benedict back in 2005. This was the scene <laughs> when people came to visit Pope Francis. Uh, this is a... <laughs> if this doesn't prove that mobile's ingrained with us now, uh, people would rather see this... People would rather see a concert or see uh, the Pope through the lens of their mobile phone than, and almost like saying I was here, uh, than actually seeing them alive. But this is a testament of uh, the proliferation we see today. So how often do we use our mobile technology? Well, on average, and this was a legitimate study that was done, <laughs> we look at our phone 150 times a day. <laughs> uh, that's, some of you probably already crossed the first 25 or 30 mark this morning already. Uh, but that's, if, if that's the case, uh, why not use that again for healthcare, right? If, if I'm managing all aspects of my life through my phone, health is probably the most important. So why not use that? So then, consumer expectation as well starts increasing, but what are we doing with the phones themselves? Well, phones are supposed to be really for voice, but only 16% of the use of our phone today is based on voice calls. The rest is used for all kinds of data activity. And so our phones are becoming computers. You know, there's already a convergence. When you see tablets today, tablets are starting to converge with laptops. You know, people are carrying more and more iPads and, and smart tablets in lieu of carrying uh, a PC or a MacBook when they're, when they're on the road. Many of you here in the audience are probably carrying tablets more than PCs. So personal computers are your phones, so why not again use phones for health? And then with phones come the expectation of being always on, being always connected, being able to be power efficient. Uh, we hate charging our phones, so making sure that they are always with us, but not, again, wired to the wall. And then having the scale, being able to get to a large audience really quickly and be able to get that audience to adopt your technologies. So with that expectation in mind, a lot of different industries have been disrupted. And Vijay talked about mobile disrupting industries. We see wireless health, and, and there's lots of nomenclature. We see mobile health, M health, wireless health, telehealth, e-health, lots of names. At Qualcomm, we just call it next generation health or next gen health because we don't see that as a niche. We just see the intersection of mobile and health coming together as just a natural progression of how the other industries have followed as well. 
So that's what's happened to the devices themselves. You know, the, the, the devices that our parents and our grandparents used to use um, have now become more consumer centric. Now when you go to a Best Buy or, or uh, to Target and others, you start seeing consumer centric sensors coming out. Why things and Fitbit as, as Michelle mentioned um, and eHealth and, and Foracare and others. All of them are coming out with really cool devices and, and of course there's a proliferation of that in Silicon Valley when you look at misfit wearables and, and, and others as well. The goal's always been get the consumer engaged. Well, now that's happening in healthcare as well. So our goal really is to bring all of the components of the wireless mobile space together. So our goal is mobilizing healthcare that's, in, in a nutshell, connecting all of these sensors so that the connectivity aspect of it really goes away. And having a world with access to healthcare anytime and anywhere. There's really nuance to this. When we got into healthcare, and we're more of a chipset company, so when we got into healthcare, um, the mandate that we looked at and, and the two pillars, if you will, on which we decided to get into healthcare uh, were really focused on the geography. In the developed world, we feel affordability is really key in healthcare, and we felt wireless could help add affordability to the equation. And then in the developing world, it's all about accessibility. It's where in some parts of the world, it's so remote that you don't have any way to actually get healthcare, let alone um, get modern healthcare. And so, enabling wireless to be that agent to bring healthcare to areas that aren't accessible today. So, affordability and accessibility have been the two pillars. And when we looked at the landscape, we really saw lots of different players out there, and we felt it was really important to bring all of the all of the players together. So, over the last ten years. We've been working with various organizations, including Vijay's here. The goal here has always been, let's have one ecosystem so we can do right by the user. You know, when grandma or even us, any of us, goes to buy a device, we shouldn't worry about, oh, which ecosystem does this belong to or which application does this belong to? If I have to download three different applications or tell my physician to go to three different websites for my readings, chances are none of my readings are going to be in one place and chances are either I'm going to stop using those devices and, and applications or my physician is going to stop accessing them. So our goal was really to unify that and so we've partnered with now over 350 companies and we've connected pretty much every one of these devices. So now a la carte you can pick and choose the devices. The goal has been always simple. As the market evolves and when you look at forecasts when you look at how mobile technology is evolving, we really see three streams, if you will, where technology is constantly evolving. The one stream, and, and we call it the convergent school of thought, it's the, the school of thought that my phone can do everything. It has an accelerometer, it has a gyroscope, it has a compass, and so why do I need another Fitbit? I can use my phone as an activity monitor. And so there's a lot of con convergence-based innovation happening. We're seeing that this year as well uh, with a lot of different new handset manufacturers coming up with new smart features. Apple did that last year with their M7 co motion coprocessor. On the flip side, we call it the diversion model. That's where we say the phone is just a display. There's a lot of cool gadgets that are miniaturized. I can have a wireless Band-Aid that's monitoring my uh, heart rate and now I can view that information everywhere. And so there's a lot of diversion um, technologies happening there as well. And then there's the middle ground. Those are uh, things that attach to my and accessorize my smartphone. And then together with the smartphone, we refer to them as the accessory sensors. But they're the ones that are like the Alive cores, the IBG stars, the, the ones that if you have an iPhone and you go to the Apple store, you'll see a bunch of them on the rack that you can connect to your iPhone and then it becomes a, a wireless sensor. We see these different technologies emerge. Our goal is to stay agnostic to that. Regardless of which one it is, we're connecting all of them so that at the end of the day, the physician can prescribe whichever handset, whichever sensor they want, and all of those connect together, and the data is going back to them. Likewise, we acquired a company last year that creates that same connectivity now across various different portals, whether it's a physician portal, a, a patient portal, and so on. So, when you look at the progression, we're actually at that second phase today. We've started mobilizing. There's lots of different sensors. We've started organizing the information. Uh, Michelle referred to Watson and some others inferring this data. We're starting to learn a little bit more about the users. And now it's time to sustain that behavior and become blended into the larger fabric of everyone's lives. 
The mobile health business that's projected here is between 30 and 60 billion. That's what we're seeing in the next two years. And you're part of that. So we're hoping that the conversions of mobile and wireless health really come, of health come together in the form of compelling use cases and solutions through many of your companies. Here's an example and a proof point of what's happening today. Uh, the UK did a study and showed that just through uh, using early intervention through mobile phones, they saw a 45% reduction in mortality rate for chronic patients um, that had heart um, uh, CHF issues. That's a great testament, but these are small proof points that are now leading up to some larger offerings. So today when you go, uh, and if you, have, if you own a car, uh, you go to your dashboard to see all of the information. You even do frequent oil changes to your car. You, you're constantly maintaining that. Why not have that same dashboard for your health? And a lot of different companies are doing that. But the goal is to collect all of that data and materialize that into evidence-based clinical outcomes. In the future, what we're going to see is every aspect of our uh, sensors, and Michelle mentioned the smart pill that Proteus has. Uh, there's a multitude of sensors today that are coming out, and we always believe at Qualcomm, we're only as strong as our ecosystem. Uh, there's always a question, why now? Why not five years ago? Healthcare was always important. Why is everybody now talking about wireless health? Well, it doesn't take one particular company. It takes an ecosystem to bring that together. Now you're seeing really smart devices. You're seeing really smart applications. You're seeing really smart platforms. All of those need to come together. And when all of them, it's uh, along the lines of uh, Malcolm Gladwell's uh, books, uh, when the time is right, everyone's doing that innovation on their end, and together they produce the right solution. So we're going to see healthcare get transformed with the internet of everything coming together for healthcare. So here's some tangible examples of what's been going on today. So this is not future, but this is something today. So we're working with Dr. Topol at um, Scripps, and I hope I'm not uh, stealing some of your thunder there, but uh, uh, really uh, compelling research around how smartphones uh, can be used to, for early intervention and bring down claim costs. So that's a great example. And if you haven't read Dr. Topol's uh, book on the creative destruction of medicine, uh, it's a textbook for anyone in this industry. It's definitely something a must read for all of us here. Um, Michelle mentioned Propeller Health. Uh, they're one of our key partners. What they did, which was really cool, was they looked at the pollen count map around the US, and they looked at who was in using their wireless inhaler in which spots. And they did a merging of those two maps to figure out where are the spots that asthmatics should avoid. And that was a great example of how disparate data sets coming together to create some meaningful, compelling, predictive models. Um, you might be familiar with Alive Core. Uh, that's an accessory that's on smartphones today. Uh, this is an example where now um, healthcare costs are being reduced by not having to be hooked up to machines in a, in a hospital, but rather just two electrodes on my smartphone can enable me to see my ECG. Uh, we're working closely with Palomar Health. Um, Glassomics is uh, what they call it. It's really around bringing various different technologies, including Google Glass and our TuneNet and Healthy Circles technologies. But the goal is simple, create meaningful, affordable solutions that have long-term impact. And then the prescribing uh, an app model, we're starting to see that a lot. Many applications, and, and the, the FDA actually had some really good guidelines uh, that clarified now uh, what constitutes an FDA-regulated app versus what constitutes uh, an app that doesn't need to go through the FDA. We're starting to see, in 2014, you're going to start seeing uh, FDA-regulated apps differentiate themselves from normal apps that, that aren't going through the FDA, primarily because they want to be considered seriously by physicians, by pr providers, to be able to, uh, to, pr to be prescribed to their patients. So where is the landscape going, and what's happening in 2014? Since this is an annual conference, and you're looking at the next 12 months, um, Michelle alluded to this. Uh, we've already heard rumors about Apple and the iWatch, but there's already a lot of watches in the market today as well, and we're going to start seeing wearables as being the key. This year, more than any other year, you're going to start seeing a lot of talk around wearables. And that's really going to be, uh, in our minds, uh, a key focus uh, in terms of what happens this Black Friday, this coming year, it'll probably be a lot of these wearables coming together. And, and a lot of the applications that the FDA regulates um, will also be a key 
um, topic for downloads. So in terms of where the industry is going, now this is looking at it long term, the cell phone's gonna be in the minority when it comes to being a wireless enabled device. There's gonna be a lot of other devices that are gonna be wireless enabled that compete with the cell phone for the same bandwidth, for the same data, data channels and for the same networks. And we estimate about 25 billion of these connected devices by 2020, and 2020 is not that far. So what are the types of use cases that we see today? Well, there's various different kinds. This was something that we did. It's a snapshot of what we showed in one of our um, conferences recently. But this is just the beginning. I'm sure there's a lot of people in the audience here who are developers. Uh, we're looking to you to create those compelling solutions using those Internet of Things and using those compelling applications and ecosystem partners. And together, I think we can create the compelling solutions of tomorrow. So the call to action from us is, you have all the tools, we'll continue to enable you, show us your creativity. Thank you.